Yesterday we introduced the concept of work, which we defined as the change in energy experienced by the object, the gain or the loss of energy experienced by something. Right now, the desk in front of Nick is sitting at rest on the floor. It's got zero joules of kinetic energy because it's not moving. It's got zero joules of potential energy because it has no potential to fall to the ground. It's on the ground already. It has no energy, period, done, that's it. How do I do work on that desk? How do I give that desk energy that it doesn't have right now? Well, there's two things that I got to do. We talked about this yesterday. First thing I got to do is push on it. You're not going to get the desk moving if there's no force applied on it. Now let's go back to Newton's first law. An object at rest will stay at rest forever and ever and ever until acted upon by an unbalanced force. So if the desk isn't moving, it's going to stay not moving unless I push on it. You want to change its energy, it's got to get moving. You want to get it moving, you got to apply a force. That's the first thing that's required, a force. Now the second thing that's required, because force isn't enough, right? I can push on this desk, it's still not moving. I'm not pushing on it very hard. Static friction is, is balancing the force that I'm pushing with, doesn't move, doesn't change its energy. In order to actually change the energy, in addition to applying a force, I have to move it. I have to cause a displacement. If you don't have a force and you don't have displacement, you don't have both of those, then the kinetic energy of that desk will remain zero and therefore no work will be done. So you need both of them in order to do work, in order to change an object's energy. That means that work which is equal to the change in energy by definition, is equal to F times D. If force and displacement are parallel to each other, so in other words, if the desk moves to the right and I push it to the right, or the desk moves to the left and I push it to the left, if the force and displacement are parallel to each other. If they're not parallel to each other, what do I got to do? Well, in essence, I've got to find a component of the force. If, if the displacement is this way and the force is this way and the angle between the two of those is 30 degrees, I have to find out how much of that force is along the same axis as the displacement. In other words, I've got to find the X component of the force. The good news is we don't have to do a lot of trigonometry for this because the equation will do it for me. The general form of the equation doesn't look like W is equal to delta E equals F times D, rather it equals F times D times cosine theta. What we're really doing there is saying, look, F cos theta is the X component of the applied force. When we take the X component and, apply, and uh, multiply it by the displacement, which is X component as well, then we get the work. Okay, so if force and displacement are in the same direction or on the same axis, Great, we don't even need the cos theta. But if they're not on the same axis, then we do need the cos theta in order to account for how much of the force is on the same axis as the displacement. All right, let me give you a couple examples here, and then we'll move on to taking a look at the homework that we had last night. Let's say that I'm pushing a wagon or pushing a car, doesn't matter, pulling a car, pushing a car, whatever, towards the right with a force of, I don't know, 50 newtons, it's moving to the right with an acceleration of whatever. What are we going to use? Are we going to use F times D, version number one, or am I going to use version number two, which is FD cosine theta? Version one or version two? Version one? Right. There is an angle, but the angle is zero. And if we say cosine zero, then cosine zero is one. And F times D times 1 is just F times D. So it's easier in a case like this when you're pushing it in the same direction that it moves just to drop the cos theta and use version number 1. What about this? Here's the wagon that I'm pulling out with an angle of, I don't know, 40 degrees, let's say. What version of the equation do I use now? Version 1 or version 2? Eric? Version 2, because there is an angle, right? Not just an angle, but an angle between the way that it moves and the way that it's pushed. I'm pulling it at 40 degrees. It's moving at 0 degrees. The difference in the angle there is 40 degrees, so I'd plug that in there. What about this one?
if I'm pulling it up at an angle of 50 degrees up this incline, and it's going up the hill at an angle of 20 degrees, which version of the equation do I use? Version 1 or version 2? Which one, Kai? It's going to be version 2, right? Because there's an angle, not just because there's an angle, but because there's an angle between the way that it moves and the way that I pull it. What angle would I use there, by the way? Would I use the 20, the 50, 70, 30? What would I use? I would use 30 degrees in that case, right? It's not the 50, it's not the 20, it's the difference between the way that it moves and the way that it's pushed. Finally, one more. Pulling it up the hill at an angle of 30 degrees there. Version 1 or version 2? Mitchell, version 1 or version 2? It's version one. Why is it version one? I get an angle of 30 degrees there. Good, exactly. Perfect way to say it. You're pulling it at the same angle as it's moving. I don't care if it's 30 degrees. I don't care if it's 68.2 degrees. If I'm pulling it at the same angle as it's moving, then the difference between the way that it moves and the way that it's pulled is zero degrees. And that's what we really care about there, right? Let's take a look at the two questions we had for homework here. Questions one on two on page 294. Any issues with either of those? No? All right, I want to take a look at question number two then. This one says a force acts at an angle of 30 degrees relative to the direction of the displacement. That's important. Okay, if a question just says a force acts at 30 degrees, that's not enough to tell me that it's version two of the equation, Fd cosine theta. If it's if the force is applied at an angle of 30 degrees, you would think you would include the cos theta, but if it also moves at 30 degrees, then the angle would be zero. But they're telling me in this question that the force is at 30 degrees relative to the way that it moves. Theta will be 30 degrees there. We want to find out what force is required to do 9,600 joules of work for displacement of 25 meters. We're going to say version 2 of the equation, delta E, uh, sorry, W is equal to Fd cos theta, which we're going to rearrange to solve for f. Now, how do you do that? How do you take the f, sorry, the d and the cos theta over to the other side? Adam? How do you take the d and the cos theta to the other side? Yeah, d is multiplied by f, so it's cos theta, so it's going to be delta d cosine theta. Now, let's sub some numbers in here and then plug it into our calculator. We get 9,600 joules divided by 25 meters times the displacement of, uh, sorry, the cosine theta, cosine 30 degrees. Now, watch carefully on the calculator. You guys can all do this, but just to make sure, we're going to say 9,600 divided by bracket 25 times cosine 30 degrees. Bracket, bracket. Why did I go two brackets stand off? Okay, I got to close off the 30 degrees, but I also have to close off the, the whole bottom term, right? We want brackets around the whole bottom term, otherwise our calculator is not going to understand what we meant there. 443. Let's go back to our data. Three digits, four digits, three digits. Final answer should be? the least precise data, which was three digits. Is that okay? All right. I got a couple more examples for you. Unfortunately, these ones don't appear in your book, so you're going to have to copy these. The first one says, a 20-kilogram object gains this much kinetic energy. It's pushed a distance of 100 meters. What's the force used to push the object? So we got a question here that most likely is going to involve work because that's what we've been doing for the last day and a half, but doesn't actually mention the word work. How do we know that this is really a work problem? Besides the fact that what else would it be because that's what we've been doing. If this appeared on an exam two and a half months from now, how would you know this is work? Yes, if we have a gain of energy, that's a change, right? And change of energy is how we define work. So when we say it gains that much energy, 
really what we're saying is the work is 300 joules. Energy change, you could say delta E is 300, but you can also say W is 300, and that's a little bit more convenient, I think. Our mass is 20 kilograms. Our displacement is 100 meters. We want to find the force. Now, we're going to assume that the force is, is in the same direction as the displacement here. The question doesn't really say that, but it should. I wrote the question, so I know that I meant it to be in the same direction. I should have just said that. Solve for force here. The work is 300 joules, and the displacement is 100 meters. The world's easiest mathematical question to solve. 300 divided by 100 is 3.00 newtons. What factor did the mass play in here? None. None. 300 joules divided by 100 meters is 3.00 newtons. Is that okay? One more, and then I'll give you a chance to work on a few questions here. This one says a 1,200-kilogram car accelerates from rest to 90 kilometers per hour. Might be a good idea to draw attention to that so we don't forget to convert that to meters per second. Over a distance of 200 meters, we want to find the work required to do this. Clearly, this is a work question because it asks us for work. So in that sense, it's easier than the last question. There's a couple of options to answer this question. What are they? What's one of them? What could I try in this question in order to solve for W? Good. Nick's got a great way of answering this question. Nick said, let's get acceleration. And we can get acceleration by using VF squared is equal to VI squared plus 2ED. And then he said, from that, I can get the force by saying F is equal to M times A, because I got M and I got A. And then from the force, I can find the work by multiplying F times D. Good. I think that's a good method where we can that we can use to solve this problem. Now, it's not the way that I was going to do it, but it is one of the two options that I was talking about. The way that I was going to do it is this. I was going to say W is not only equal to F times D, but it's also equal to, by definition, delta E. Right? Work is defined as the change in energy. Now, ask yourself this. What's the final energy? Not the amount, but the type of energy. What kind does it have at the end of this problem? After the car has accelerated to 90 kilometers per hour. What kind of energy does it have? Right, it's got kinetic energy. So my final energy minus my initial energy will be kinetic energy minus what kind do I have at the start? What kind of energy does this car have before it speeds up? Why does it have potential? Because it has no kinetic? In order to have potential, it's got to have a height, or it's got to be on a spring or an elastic that's stretched or compressed. Is that a height? Is it on a spring or an elastic? So there's no potential either. The energy of the initial is zero. Just because you don't have kinetic doesn't mean you have to have potential. At the beginning of this problem, there would be zero joules. So we're going to say uh, one-half of 1,200. Now, we've got to convert this to meters per second. We're going to multiply that by 1,000, 90,000 meters, divided by 3,600 seconds gives me 25 meters per second. So we're going to say it's 1 half of 1,200 times 25 squared minus 0. I don't remember what that worked out to be. Uh, 25 squared was 625. 625 times 600 was 375,000 joules, which we're going to round to to two digits, 3.8 times 10 to the 5 joules. Now, you do it Nick's way, get the acceleration using Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2ad. Get the force by saying F is equal to m times a. Get the work by saying W is equal to F times D. That works just fine. But you notice what I've done there, Nick? I've used three equations, whereas I've used one equation in this one. I wouldn't say my way is better than your way. My way is definitely quicker than your way. On a test, 
hey, on a test, you do it Nick's way, that's just as good as my way because it's going to get you the same answer, right? What are you more comfortable with? Nick's way, three-stepper, A, F, and W, or my way, W is equal to delta E? You know what? I don't really care which way you're more comfortable with. you got to be able to do it both ways, basically. Be, be familiar with both ways. But in the end, in the end, uh, if you find one way easier, then you can, for the most part, do it that way. I would like everybody, as the worksheets are being handed out, to please work on the first worksheet. We're going to call it the work squared sheet. Because, as you know, it's a work work sheet. You're going to work on questions one, two, four, and five for now on the work squared sheet. All right, if we feel comfortable with that worksheet, I want to take a look at the next topic, which is the second to last topic we do this unit, which is good because we got a test on Tuesday. Topic of power. I want to give you a hypothetical situation to help you to understand the difference between power and work, which we've been doing for the last two days now. Let's assume that the weather turns. We've had fantastic weather since the beginning of the year. The snow pile at the bottom of the hill right now is zero. It's gone. It's not even exi it doesn't even exist. Last year, that snow pile at the bottom of the hill, down by the dog stadium, lasted till the beginning of August. It's gone at the beginning of April this year. That's how little snow we've had. But let's pretend that, let's say you wake up tomorrow and there's snow. There's a foot of snow on the ground. Nick wakes up in the morning. Okay, let's say uh, Caitlin w wakes up in the morning. Let's say they live beside each other. They probably don't, but let's pretend that they live beside each other. Same neighborhood. The driveway is the same length. The driveway is the same width. The, the exact same amount of snow in Nick's driveway is in Caitlin's driveway. They both wake up at 7.30 to go to school. Good news. Mom says school's canceled. You don't have to go to school today. You've got a foot of snow on the ground. The bad news is you guys got to go out and shuffle your driveways. So Nick goes out at 7.30 and shovels his, begins shoveling his driveway. Caitlin goes out at the exact same time, begins to shovel her driveway. Hey, how's it going, Nick? School's canceled. Nick says, yeah, I know. Isn't that great? But we've got to shovel these darn driveways. So they start shoveling their driveways. An hour later, Caitlin's done shoveling the driveway. Three hours later, Nick's still not done. Another hour beyond that, he finally finishes, four hours later. Caitlin takes an hour to shovel her driveway. Nick takes four hours to shovel his driveway. Now, they both did a really good job. Both really clean driveways. Okay, impeccable. If you were hiring one of those people to shovel your driveway, who would you hire? You'd hire him. That's a good call. That's a good call. If you're the person that has to shovel the driveway, why not hire him, right? If I was hiring one of these two people, it would depend upon how I was paying them. If I was paying them by the amount of work they did, who would I hire? Who did more work? You both did the same amount of work. Now, you may have picked up more snow in, your, in a shovel than she did. She may have picked up less. Therefore, you had to apply more force. But you would have had to do less shovelfuls in that case, right? On average, the amount of force that you had to apply in the displacement of the snow was the same, on average. That means that you both did the same amount of work, exactly the same. So if I'm paying you by the job how much work you did, it doesn't matter who I hire. You both did a good job. You both do the same amount of work. If I pay you 20 bucks to shovel the driveway or 30 bucks to shovel the driveway, I get the same work done no matter what. Now, if I'm paying you by the hour, I'm going to hire Caitlin, right? Because Caitlin's a lot quicker at doing the same amount of work. How do I quantify that? They both do the same amount of work. So how do I differentiate between... Caitlin's job and Nick's job. What's the argument for hiring Caitlin over Nick when they both do the same amount of work? Yeah, how quickly they do it or the rate at which the work is done. The rate at which work is done is defined as power. So Caitlin, in this case, although she did the exact same amount of work as Nick did, she's more powerful at doing it. And if I'm paying you by the hour, that's what I'm interested in, is the power output 
of the person that I'm hiring as opposed to the work done by the person. How quickly they can do that work. Now, if you go back, way back, way back to the beginning of the year in February, we defined velocity as the rate at which position changes. So the equation for velocity was change in position over time. We defined acceleration as the rate at which velocity changes. So it was delta V over delta T. Anything that's a rate has time on the bottom. So power as the rate at which work is done would be what? That's got time on the bottom, right? Because it's a rate. Something over time. What do you think it is? What over time? Work over time. Power is work over time. Now, what do you think the units for that would be? Let's go to our equation. Let's look at it. It's not rocket science to figure out what the units for this, work, for this power is, or are. Let's go joules per second. Work over time is joules per second. But there is now another set of units that we can also use for power, which means the same thing as a joule per second. What do you think that unit might be? What do you think is the other unit for power? That watt. Watt is the other unit for power. Now, we often abbreviate a watt as simply a W. That's a little bit confusing. W is work. W is watts. Here's the thing. If you see W equals something, then that means it's work. If you see something watts, something W, then it's power. So W is 10, that's work. 10 watts is power. Does that make sense? A little bit confusing because it's the exact same symbol. A little bit more confusing because work and power are actually closely related to each other. So we often see them within the same question. Okay, but if you remember that W comes first, it's work. W comes after, it's power. Then you should be good to go. Now, I want to do an example. But this example is going to be different than any of the examples we've done this year involving power. Here's what I want to do for our example. I want to come up with a different example for each of you. So what we're going to do is go out into the hallway. We're going to go out into the stairwell, in fact. And we're going to climb some stairs. And we're going to use that to determine what the power output is of your legs. So we're going to find out what Merrick's power output is. We're going to find out what Hugh's power output is. We're going to find out what Caitlin's power output is of their legs. Here's the question. Here's the example question. What is the power output of your legs? Now, here's how we're going to find that. The power output of Merrick's legs or Caitlin's legs or anybody's, Phil's legs, anybody's legs, is going to be W over T, work over time. The time that it takes you to climb those stairs is easy to measure. You're going to take your phone out there. You're going to start your time when you start going up the stairs. You're going to stop it when you reach the top of the stairs. Easy. The work done by you in climbing the stairs is a little bit tougher. You could say, legitimately, the work done as you climb the stairs is equal to the force that you apply going up the stairs times the displacement of the stairs. Displacement wouldn't be that hard to find, but the force that you apply going up the stairs at that angle would actually be a little bit tricky. So we're not going to do it that way. It's legitimate, but it would be tricky. What else is W equal to besides F times D? What else is it, Laura? Change in energy. That's what we're going to use here. We're going to say W is equal to the change in energy. Now, what kind of energy do you have when you reach the top of the stairs? Sophie, what kind of energy do you have at the top of the stairs? Kinetic energy is you're going up the stairs, but as, when you reach the top and you're done and you're, phew, I'm tired, what kind of energy do you have at the top? You stopped because you're out of breath. Stop. Potential energy, gravitational potential energy, right? So my final energy here would be potential energy. My initial energy would be, as you're standing at the bottom being all cocky, thinking I'm going to get to the top of the stairs quicker than anybody else before you run out of breath, what kind of energy do you have then? You're standing there at the bottom of the stairs. can't fall down. You're not moving. You have 
zero, right? So the work done in climbing to the top of the stairs is equal to the final energy minus the initial, which is potential minus zero. Power, therefore, becomes equal to your final potential energy divided by the time. Now, if it's your legs that drive you up the stairs, then that power output is the power output of your legs. Make sense? So here's what you got to do. Everybody has got to measure the time that it takes themselves to get up the stairs. Everybody has to know what their mass is. Maybe you know what your mass is in kilograms already. Maybe you don't. If you don't, then you can step on the scale at the front of the room here. There's two scales on this, pounds and, and kilograms. You obviously want the kilograms. G is 9.81. The final height? Well, I'll tell you what. The first, I don't know, 10 times I did this little activity, we measured the height of the stairs because I would always forget what it was. And then it occurred to me one day, the reason I always kept getting 3.0 meters is because one story in a building like this is always three meters. So you climb up a flight of stairs, that's what it is. It's three meters. We don't need to measure it again. We know the height will be 3.0 meters. G will be 9.81 meters per second squared. You're going to measure your mass. You're going to measure your time. And then you're going to calculate your power. Got it? You may run up the stairs to, to maximize your power output. You don't have to. You can walk up the stairs as slow as you want. If you want to find your maximum power output, okay, as powerful as you can be, then you need to get up the stairs as quickly as you can get up there. But if you're not interested in knowing what your maximum power output is, that's okay. Just walk up the stairs leisurely and find out what your power output was for that particular trip up the stairs. Got it? All right, have a look up here, guys. We're going to use Adam's data as an example here. If you haven't finished calculating yours, I want you to finish that right away, please. Adam's mass was 64 kilograms. We know that Adam climbed stairs to overcome gravity, the acceleration of gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. We know that Adam's final height was 3.0 meters when he reached the top of the flight of stairs. And we know that the time that it took him to climb that flight of stairs using only his legs was 4.0 seconds. When you multiply those numbers, divide by 4 seconds, what do you get, Adam? Was it 400? 470.88. 470 which we're going to say 471 watts, 471 joules per second. That means that Adam's legs, if he ran as fast as he could, which I suspect he probably didn't run as fast as he could, may have, um, to me that number tells me that he didn't walk up leisurely, but he also didn't run up as fast as he could. But if that is his peak power output, then that means his legs can, can use up or supply 471 joules of energy every second that his legs are working, right? Now, I'm curious um, what some, some other people got here. We got one of them that's 1163.9 watts. How many people were over 750? One, two, three, four, five people over 750? If you were over 750, I want you to recognize that one horsepower you hear horsepower in terms of like cars and whatever, right? Machines. One horsepower is defined as 750 watts. You guys know who the, the, the inventor of the steam engine was? James Watt? Okay. James Watt decided that when he's measuring power, People didn't really have a concept of what power was, so we said basically, I'm going to compare it to a horse, and I'm going to arbitrarily define this as a horsepower. A horse actually is a little bit less powerful than a horsepower. A horse isn't really as strong as a horse. Um, if you had a power output of 750 watts, then that's arbitrarily defined as one horsepower, which is a little bit stronger than a horse really is. That means if you had a power output of 1,100 and something watts, that means you're as strong as one and a half horses for, what, the two seconds it took you to climb up the stairs. Now, the benefit of using a horse in the field as opposed to you 
in the field is that a horse tends to be able to maintain that power output for a little bit longer than you would. Okay. But for a short time, for a short time, you're as strong as one and a half horses. All right? Here's what I want you to work on now. It's your power worksheet. It's the second one in that little booklet. Please complete for tomorrow, in addition to your lab that's due tomorrow, questions one to five on that power worksheet, as well as whatever you didn't finish on the work squared sheet that I signed earlier on.